Welcome back. Today we're going to continue examining language and thought. We're going to look at more experiments that deal with the more ways in which languages differ from one another and how that may or may not affect the way that people think. So we are here. We are studying language and thought, which is one aspect of the psychology and the cognitive science of language. We've been talking about the idea of linguistic relativity. The linguistic relativity hypothesis is the idea that language some, the language someone speaks actually affects how they think and perceive the world, also called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. Remember that we can divide this into the strong Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, which says that the language you speak determines and constrains the thoughts you can think which is also called linguistic determinism. And there's the weak Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, which is that the language you speak has some influence on the thoughts you think, but maybe not a dramatic influence and maybe not a deterministic influence. So recall that the experimental status of this idea of linguistic relativity is something like this. The strong Sapir-Whorf hypothesis does not currently have experimental support. The weak Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, the idea that language has some influence on your thoughts, does have some limited experimental support, and as we've seen, the effects are often subtle. So strong Sapir-Whorf so far does not appear to be true. Weak Sapir-Whorf does appear to be true, with a lot of asterisks and footnotes and qualifications. So. Linguistic relativity, remember, is not about the idea that your thoughts affect your language. No one is doubting that the thoughts you think affect the things you say. Linguistic relativity is about whether there's a feedback where the language you speak actually constrains and structures and influences the thoughts in your head. And remember, our basic procedure for, to test the linguistic relativity hypothesis across languages is that we find two or more languages that differ in how they describe the world in some way. Then we do experiments on speakers of those languages to see if they think and perceive the world differently. So we're going to look at results from three new domains today. We already looked at words for colors last time. Now we're going to look at words for numbers across languages, and we're going to see whether that affects how people think about quantities and numerosities across languages. We're going to look at words for spatial relations, whether how you describe how objects are arrayed in space. And we're going to look at words for time relations. How do different languages describe the flow of time? Languages differ quite a bit in this, and we're going to see if that changes the way that people think about time. So we already did words for colors. Today, we'll be proceeding next to words for numbers. This is an aspect of the lexicon of a language. So not all languages actually have words for all of the exact numbers, as we do in English and in other languages spoken by industrialized cultures. So many languages are what we linguists call one too many languages. What that means is that these languages have a word that means exactly one, they have a word that means exactly two, and above that, you don't have precise words. Above two, you just describe it as many. Or maybe you have a bunch of words like few or several or many. You have these sort of vague words which express a quantity greater than two, but not a precise quantity. Sometimes in these languages, even the words for one and two are somewhat fuzzy. So think about the phrase couple in English when someone asks for a couple of something. You could ask for a couple donuts. Some people use that word couple to mean something more like uh, approximately two rather than exactly two. This is an area of idiolectal and dialectical variation in English. So in these languages, officially they have numbers for one and two, but when you look closely, you find that they actually even use those words somewhat approximately. So I'm going to be talking about the language spoken by this group, the Piraha. This is a hunter-gatherer group spoken in an isolated area in the Amazonian rainforest in Brazil. These are speakers of a one to many language. In fact, they are speakers of a language where the words for numbers are quite approximate. And we're going to be looking at experiments that have done, been done with speakers 
of this language to determine if they think about numbers and quantities in a way which is meaningfully different than speakers of other languages. So this is a very small group, only a few hundred people in Amazonia. Interestingly, they are overwhelmingly monolingual. So they are in an environment where they're surrounded by people who speak Portuguese and who speak other indigenous languages, but this tribe, for whatever reason, is uh, massively monolingual. They typically do not learn these other languages. They're quite insular in that way. So they don't have much experience with numbers even coming from Portuguese. Here's how the Piraha number system works. So if you have one object, you call it hoi, and so the accents here indicate tones. If you have two objects, you call it hoi. That's a slightly different tone. This is a different word. If you have three objects, again, you call it hoi. If you have four objects, you call it either hoi or aibai. If you have five, you call it aibagi. Six, seven, eight, aibagi. So we can see that this is basically a one too many language. You have hoi, which means it might mean exactly one, or it might just mean a very small quantity. We're not actually sure. You have hoi, which means a few, and you have aibagi, which means many. So, do the Piraha think about numbers and quantities differently than, say, English speakers or Portuguese speakers that they're surrounded with? So, like, would Piraha speakers think about this quantity here, six things, as the same as this quantity here, which is seven things? So they would use the same word, aibagi, for both of these. Would they actually think about these two sets of things as having the same number, as having the same numerosity, the same cardinality? An interesting question. So the strong Sapir-Whorf hypothesis would say that, yes, the Piraha speakers are actually unable to distinguish between these two different numbers of things because they don't have words for it. The weak Sapir-Whorf hypothesis would say, no, they, they probably can distinguish between these things, but their language is going to influence how they do it in a potentially subtle way. So are these the same quantity? Easy to answer as an English speaker. Maybe a Piraha speaker would not be able to tell you. So the way that this has been tested, the way that the numerical cognition of the Piraha has been tested, has been using something called the nuts in a can task. So the idea is you, you fly out to the rainforest, you go to the Piraha, and you invite them into a, a place, and you sit on a table, and you have a can, and you throw a bunch of nuts into the can. So here we're going to throw in some nuts. We're throwing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then you ask the Piraha person to put in the same number of nuts that you put in. So I put in six, and then the orange one coming in was the first one from the Piraha person. They put in one, two, three, four, five, six. If they put in the same number of nuts as I put in, then you say they succeeded on the task. Otherwise, you say they did not get it right. So here are the results you get from the nuts in a can task. First, these are the typical results you get for an English speaker. So the x-axis here tells you how many nuts I put into the can, and the y-axis tells you how many nuts the other person put into the can when I asked them to put in the same number. So when I put in four, the English speakers typically put in four. When I put in 12, the English speakers typically put in 12. English speakers are basically perfectly accurate at this. It's not a hard task, right? Because you can count. But what would this be like if you can't count, if you don't have numbers for specific quantities? This is the pattern you get with the Piraha. So you ask them to, to, you put in four nuts, you ask them to put in the same number. Typically they'll get that right. They'll usually also put in four. But if you put in like 10, see, you can see here that the Piraha people will put in any number of nuts. So they cannot reliably put in 10 nuts after I put in 10 nuts, which makes perfect sense because uh, they don't have numbers for keeping track of these exact quantities. Okay, so we have some evidence here for linguistic relativity. It looks like the fact that English speakers have words for numbers means that we can sort of track numbers and think about numbers in a way which is maybe different from Piraha speakers. But not so fast. Remember the experiments we did with color last time. So we asked if color categories were changing how people perceived colors. And it turns out the answer was not really. 
It turns out the color categories were more like giving people a tool they could use to remember colors. In this case also, maybe it's not the case that the Piraha think about number differently. Maybe they don't have a fundamentally different idea of number. Maybe it's just that when you're an English speaker, you have this tool that you can use called counting to keep track of exact numbers. The Piraha might think about quantities the same way, but they just don't have that particular tool of counting. So, does this really mean Piraha speakers think about quantity different than English speakers? Or does it mean that English speakers just have this extra tool? So remember that when we looked at color, the way that we sort of eliminated the ability to use language as a tool to remember things was using verbal interference. Verbal interference is when you make someone repeat back a bunch of words while they're doing a task. Because they're repeating back a bunch of words, that means they're occupying their phonological loop. That means that they are unable to use words to remember things and to keep track of things. So what would happen if we did the nuts in a can task for English speakers with verbal interference? So what if you just take English speakers and take away their ability to count? Then what are they going to look like? So verbal interference prevents people from remembering a word in a phonological loop. It also prevents you from keeping track of a number verbally in that phonological loop. So remember, here we have English speakers without interference. And here we have Piraha speakers, again, without interference. Here's what the English speakers look like with interference. So you ask English speakers to repeat back a bunch of words so that they can't count. And now their accuracy is similar to the Piraha. These were actually MIT undergraduates. And you can see that even the MIT undergraduates, under verbal interference, their accuracy is about the same as the Piraha. So it's not that the way that the Piraha think about number is fundamentally different than the way that MIT undergraduates think about number. It's just that when you speak a language like English, English gives you this tool called counting, which you can use to keep track of quantities, but it doesn't change your underlying thinking. Because if I take away your ability to count, then you'd look just like the Piraha. So the way which is emerging to think about this kind of thing is that we can think of number as a kind of cognitive technology. So Piraha speakers can't keep track of exact quantities of objects that are hidden in like a can, but given verbal interference, English speakers can't either. Number words as a cognitive technology means that number words provide you with a useful way to remember things, but it's not like they rewire your brain or the way you fundamentally think. It's just like it gives you a tool. So it's like your cell phone, or it's like having a calculator. A calculator certainly gives you the ability to calculate things that you couldn't calculate otherwise, but it doesn't change how you think about numbers. It's just an additional thing that you might be able to use. So that is number. And we're going to see that this idea of language as a kind of providing cognitive technologies is more or less true in a bunch of other domains too. We saw it in color. The general idea being that language can extend your thought, can give you certain basically tricks that you can use to accomplish cognitive tasks, but it doesn't seem to change your underlying thinking. We're going to move on to spatial relations now and the way that languages differ in how they express the arrangement of objects in three-dimensional space. So how do languages vary in terms of how they describe spatial relations? So relative space languages. That's a kind of language which uses words that indicate directions from the perspective of the speaker or the perspective of the listener in a conversation. So relative space languages are languages where I, is where I say something like, if you're standing next to a chair, I'd say the chair is near you. I'm describing the location of the chair relative to you. Or maybe I'd say it's near me relative to me. So English is like this. Spanish is like this. Most, again, languages spoken by large industrialized cultures living in large geographical regions are like this. They're relative space languages. L relative space languages use words like left and words like right, and words of in, like in front of, and words like behind. These are all words which are relative to something, in most cases relative to the speaker or the listener. Another major kind of language, and people are often surprised to learn that this kind of language exists, is something called an absolute space language. 
So absolute space languages do not indicate locations relative to a speaker or a listener. Rather, they indicate directions relative to fixed landmarks in the environment. So these are languages where you do not have words like left and right. Rather, you always use words like north, south, east, and west. So I would say something like, there's a chair which is to the west of you. Or I'd say something like, uh, there, there is a fly on your northern arm. Languages like this will also, also use not only the cardinal directions, but also particular landmarks in the areas where they're spoken, like uphill. I might say there's a fly on your uphill arm. This would be like in a language spoken by a small group that lives along an incline. So an example of a language like this would be a, a Mayan language spoken in Mexico called the Tenejapan Celtal. This is a widely studied language, which um, is a absolute space languages. These things are also common among the Aboriginal languages of Australia. So do speakers of absolute space languages think about location in a way which is different than speakers of relative space languages? This was investigated in an experiment by uh, Levinson and Brown, which looks like this. So here's how the experiment works. You sit someone down in front of a table, and on that table there's an arrow. The arrow is pointing in some direction. So let's say that you start off on the left here, and you're looking at this arrow. From your perspective here, that arrow is going to be pointing to the right, right? So from your perspective, the arrow is pointing to the right. Now I flip you around. I flip you around 180 degrees, and now there's another table there, and there's two arrows there, and I ask you, which is the same arrow? If you're thinking in terms of relative space, then the arrow that's going to be the same is the one that's pointing to your right. So that would be arrow B here. On the other hand, if you're thinking in terms of absolute space, in terms of relations relative to fixed cardinalities and fixed landmarks, then you're going to think arrow A is the same, because in both cases they're pointing, let's say, that's north. So it turns out that English speakers will choose arrow B, because English is a relative space language. You choose the same arrow based on the fact that it is pointing to the right from your perspective. On the other hand, Celtal speakers will choose arrow A, because they speak an absolute space language, and in this case they're looking for the arrow that points north. That's what they would consider the same arrow. So this is the axis on which English speakers judge the arrow. And that's reversed when you flip someone around, but the absolute orientation of the arrow is not reversed. So let's say that up is north. Up is still north when you flip someone around. OK, so is this evidence that speakers of languages like English think about space in a way which is fundamentally different from speakers of language like Celta? Or is it maybe a more sort of context-specific effect? So these absolute space languages are usually spoken by people that live in a small circumscribed geographical region that has prominent landmarks. And that makes perfect sense, right? If the way your language works is you describe things as uphill or downhill, well, then you'd better live in a place where that hill is always around. Because once you're out of that place, you're not going to be able to describe spatial relations anymore. So these absolute languages are usually spoken by people in a sort of, not necessarily really small, but a region that certainly has prominent and stable geographic landmarks. And when this experiment was done with Celtal speakers, it was done by traveling to the villages and the towns where the Celtal speakers were. It was done outdoors. So the Celtal speakers are sitting outdoors. They can see all those landmarks around them that define the way their language thinks about spatial relations. Whereas the English speakers were actually tested indoors in a room that had no actual landmarks. So maybe what's going on is not that the language is determining how Celtal speakers are behaving, Maybe it's actually the environment. Maybe it's because the Teltal speakers are in this environment where they recognize the landmarks that they choose to identify lines according to their orientation with respect to those landmarks. OK, so what would happen then if we tested English speakers not in a featureless room, but in an environment with well-known landmarks? <laughs> 
So what if I do this experiment with English speakers, but in a place that you know well? So here is the UCI Student Union, a place that I hope you know well. I know some of you haven't been able to make it here yet, but um, I hope that you either know this place well or you will know it soon. So let's say you're sitting outside next to this very prominent, very well-known landmark, and I sit you at the table, and the arrow is now pointing towards the union, and then I flip you around and ask you to say which is the same arrow. So if you are solely being influenced by your language, you are again going to choose arrow B, because arrow B is the one which is pointing to the right. But if you are taking into account the environment you're in, regardless of your language, then maybe you're going to choose arrow A here, because you're going to choose the arrow which is also pointing towards the student union. So it turns out that when you do this, English-speaking students behave just like Tseltal students. They did this at the University of Pennsylvania outside of some prominent building there, I don't know what, in view of prominent landmarks. And when you do that, suddenly the English speakers look just like the Tseltal speakers. So maybe it's not the language which was affecting how people were behaving, maybe it was just the environment. And in an environment that has stable landmarks, you end up having a language that has these absolute space relations. So also, the, um, you can also get the English speakers to behave like Tseltal speakers simply by putting them in a room with a window, where now the window provides a landmark, rather than a featureless room like in the original experiment. So is there really a Sapir-Whorf effect here? Did we really find evidence for linguistic relativity? Well, it's kind of complicated. So in terms of the language directly affecting thought, it looks like no, it has more to do with your environment. But your environment can actually affect your language. So the people that live in the environments with these landmarks end up speaking these absolute space languages, which also reflect the thoughts, the behavior which they were already having on the basis of their environment. This, this is actually an area where I would say the evidence is unresolved. So I have presented now the first sort of two experiments in a long series of experiments. There's been a lot of back and forth where you know, one group will go to the Teltal and do the experiment in a slightly different way, and then another group will do it at some university on English speakers in a slightly different way. There's a lot of back and forth here. I've just presented the first two. It's a really interesting thing to read. So that's spatial relations. Now I'm going to turn to the last area in which languages vary in a way which might interestingly affect the thoughts that speakers think, and that's going to be words for time relations. So this gets at this issue I mentioned earlier, which is what are the underlying metaphors that are used to structure a language? So languages use different underlying metaphors to describe time. For example, in English, we say things like, I am spending time doing something, I am wasting time, I'm investing time on a project. If we say things like budget your time wisely, there's an underlying metaphor here, which is embedded in the English language, which is that time is like money. The words we use for time are like the words we use for money, as in these examples. This metaphor is not universal. Not all languages have this kind of metaphor. Another example, we say things like the summer was long. We say the winter will be short. The idea here is that time duration is similar to length in space. Again, this is not universal. So in other languages, even other European languages, you will say something like the summer was big or the winter will be small. So in some languages, time duration is equated with volume, whereas in English, time duration is equated with length. So in Greek, people say the summer was big, the winter will be small. Time duration is size or volume in those other languages. So. Across languages, time relations are expressed using metaphors, typically with space. As we saw in English and Greek, the time duration is expressed using a metaphor with spatial length, and in Greek it's expressed using a metaphor with spatial size. In English, we also say things like, um, the future is ahead of us, the past is behind us. You can find these metaphors embedded in almost all the words we use to describe time relations. Most words describing time relations 
were originally words describing spatial relations. And then over time, they sort of shifted from describing space to describing time. Words like before, words like after. So before originally meant something like you are standing before the door. That originally indicated a spatial relation, and eventually it turned into a time relation. And then similarly, most of those words for describing spatial relations actually originated as words for body parts. So before, the, the for in before is related to for as in forehead. So the words like back and for, when I say back in the past, what we have there is a body part description, back, which turns into a spatial description, like being in the back of something, which eventually turns into a time description. We see this sort of chaining in terms of how time relations end up being described. Our time relations typically are things which used to solely be space relations, which in turn typically used to be body parts and body relations. So there are other ways you can get time metaphors though. So in English, we typically think about the past as being behind us, the future as being in front of us. But the metaphor is actually reversed in languages like Aymara. Aymara is an indigenous language spoken in Bolivia and Peru. So in Aymara, actually the future is behind you and the past is in front of you. And this might seem really strange and counterintuitive if you're not used to this, but it actually makes sense. So in Aymara, for example, to say last year, the words you use are frontier. So it would be Nairamara. If you want to say yesterday, what you say is back day, Kripuuru. If you want to say the day from now on, you say the day from behind now, which is Akata Kripuuru. In Aymara, the word for front is actually derived from the word for I, and that explains what's going on here. So the word for front is not um, indicating the front of the body, it's not indicating the forehead, rather it's indicating the eye. And the past is in front of you in that sense because you have knowledge of the past. In some sense, you can see the past, right? So in that sense, it makes perfect sense that the, 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 the past is in front of you. Whereas the future, you cannot see the future. The future is gonna be a surprise. So in that sense, if you can say that the future is behind you. You don't see it, you don't have knowledge of it. So you can see the past, you can't see the future. So in Aymara, you start off with different body relations. You're using eyes rather than foreheads and stuff. And then that turns into spatial relations, and then that turns into time relations, which end up being reversed as compared with English. So it turns out that this does exert an influence on at least the behavior of Aymara speakers beyond just their language. So even when Aymara speakers are speaking in Spanish. They actually gesture using the Aymara metaphor. So here's a great example. This is a uh, video of uh, two Aymara speakers talking to each other. And each frame of the video it shows how the guy on the right is gesturing when he's saying different words. So he's speaking Spanish. He's saying el tiempo antiguo, so the old time in the old times. And look at how he's gesturing when he says that. He's saying el tiempo antiguo. The past is in front of him. So we see that his gestures are reflecting the Aymara metaphor where the past is in front of you. Another example would be this guy. This is from another set of video interviews of Aymara speakers. What this guy is saying here is el futuro, and he's pointing back. So he's saying in the future, again using the Aymara metaphor. So there's this very interesting connection between the way Aymara speakers speak about time and the way they gesture spatially and, and using their bodies about time, even when they're not speaking Aymara. So it, a, we wanted to find out, a group wanted to find out if people would actually think about time differently based on the metaphors that their language uses. So. If you ask American English speakers to arrange images that have a temporal order from the past to the future, they're typically going to do that from left to right. Whereas Arabic speakers are typically going to arrange the images from right to left. Why do you think that might be the case? So if you uh, know how to write and read Arabic or other languages written using the Arabic script, 
then you might be able to get a hint for why it is that English speakers usually arrange images from left to right, Arabic speakers usually arrange them from right to left. There is something about the way we write these languages which affects certain ways that we think about time, ways we map time onto space. Speakers of languages like Pomporao, which is an Australian Aboriginal language, that's an absolute space language, actually arrange the images from east to west, according to an experiment by Boroditsky and Gabby. So interesting to think about. Why would it be the case that they would arrange images from east to west when expressing time relations? Let me know in the comments why you think they would arrange images from east to west. How is this tested? So people Speakers of these different languages were given a bunch of pictures like this, which have a clear temporal sequence. This is pictures of a guy getting older, right? So there's a clear progression here from the past to the future, from the distant past to the more recent, recent past, maybe. And when you ask English speakers to arrange them, these things, they do it from left to right. Arabic speakers go right to left. Pormpural speakers do it from east to west. So. To summarize the status of the linguistic relativity hypothesis, the weak Sapir-Whorf hypothesis is the idea that the language you speak has some influence on the thoughts you think. And this is true. According to the experimental evidence that currently exists, this is our best understanding of the phenomenon so far. It's true, but it's subtle. The effects of language appear to go away under verbal interference or when you change the environment that someone is in. And the non-linguistic environment, as I said, plays a large role. So the overall way we can think about this is that language provides us with something like cognitive technologies. Language allows us to extend our cognitive abilities in certain ways. It gives us certain tricks that we can use to like remember colors, to count quantities, to arrange things on tables. But it doesn't appear that language fundamentally alters our underlying thoughts. So does the language you speak affect the thoughts you think? So the government in 1984 says their goal is to make all other modes of thought impossible. And they thought that once they can teach everyone new speak and they forget old speak, then a heretical thought should be literally unthinkable. Is this possible? Given the current state of knowledge, it appears that this is not how it works. This is not how it works. If you got everyone to speak new speak, maybe they would find certain tasks slightly easier or harder. But it does not appear that we currently have evidence that language can actually constrain the way you think and actually make certain thoughts unthinkable. 